Okay, I would you. like to call the number. meeting to order, please. This uh, is the here, City oh, Council man. Special <laughs> Session meeting of November 20th. We have four items on the agenda. Um, the first item is an update on establishing the filing dates and election dates for the City Council Municipal Election and Municipal Runoff Elections. And Brenda will do the presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as many of you know, last year, um, a lot of the statutes were changed that limited, once again, our the days in which we could hold election, elections and council at that time asked for a charter amendment to try to make them consistent. So uh, there's not that much um, give and take for you this year as far as dates in order to complete fulfill the charter requirement of uh, February and April. Those dates are predetermined and then kind of back into your filing dates. So basically, uh, this is just more of an advisory update that the election, the municipal election will be held on February the 12th with the runoff election on April the 2nd. And the filing dates will be December 17th through the 19th. That allows us to meet all the timing uh, requirements for filing and notifying the election board within the guidelines established in statute. So you will um, adopt that by resolution at your meeting next Tuesday to formalize that. And that's all. Any, what, yeah. Council Member Holman. Uh, just to provide some historical context for anybody that may not be familiar, uh, due to changes in state laws over the last few years, um, it really limited the times when cities could have elections. And I think most of us on council the last couple of years have felt that it was important that our city council elections be consistent and be the same month every year. And because of the change in state law, the way I understand it, February was the only month where we could have it be the same month every year. So um, I think many of us felt like March and April were more ideal times to do it because it's really cold in January and December and campaign is difficult. But February was the only month available to have make sure that it's the same month every year. And we kind of wanted to get Norman residents in the habit of just count on it every February, city council elections, every single February. Until the legislature changes. Until the city. Yeah. <laughs> council Member Wilson. Um, so it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Five. Yeah, Tuesday. I thought it was Tuesday. I thought, I don't know it's always it three Tuesday. days. Starts Monday, on Monday Tuesday at 8 a.m. and ends it's always Wednesday on Monday. at 5. Okay. Just making sure I got it right. Guess who will be early? Any other questions? Item number two is discussion regarding the FYE 2019 Capital Improvements Program Budget and FYE 2020-2024 Capital Improvement Plan. And the presentation will be by Jane Hudson. And it looks like she will be assisted by Mr. Francisco. Good evening. So we will uh, present the FYE uh, 19 Capital Improvement Program budget status. Is this an in I'm sorry, is this an enter or is this an arrow down? To this arrow? Okay. So for the capital budget calendar, uh, we have today, of course, which is the update on the funded projects and the discussion for uh, council priorities. Following up, we'll have a February 26, 2019 discussion on proposed new projects. And then on April 23rd, we will have the review of the final proposed plan for FYE 2020. So for the capital project sources, uh, the purpose of the CIP is to support the services of the municipal government. Projects are identified in the long range master plans are reviewed by citizens and adopted by city council, such as the land use plan, transportation plan, parks, uh, water, wastewater, greenway, stormwater, etc. Uh, the priorities are set at short range and long range. The short range needs go into a five year capital plan with proposed schedules of implementation and available funding sources. The CIP plans uh, are adopted annually. With, uh, we have emergencies and high priority unanticipated projects that uh, those needs can be added as we move throughout the, uh, the fiscal year. And the sources for the funding include enterprise revenue, special election uh, approvals, grants, private and capital penny sales tax. 
so just to, to outline, what is a capital project? It's a project which is gen uh, which generally costs more than a hundred thousand uh, dollars, fixed, relatively fixed, or permanent in nature. It's an asset with an expected expected life of more than five years. It consists of construction of uh, new, expanded, or improved tangible assets, and typically takes more than one fiscal year to complete. We uh, have. Uh, contracted uh, services for design, land acquisition, and utility relocations may be required for those projects. <coughs> for the capital outlay, those are the expenses uh, maintaining or purchasing new or replacing tangible assets which have a expected life of one to five years. A one-time occurrence and expenses occur in a single fiscal year. These can include vehicles, computers, furniture, equipment and then the capital outlay is paid uh, by the capital fund expended from the general fund and Westwood fund with the capital penny sales tax transferred to cover the cost. The funds included in the CIP budget, um, these are considered special purpose funds such as the uh, PSST, CDBG, uh, room tax, you, know, you can read all those, we've got Norman Forward sales <coughs> tax fund, University North Park TIF uh, District Fund. The funds included in the CIP budget for the enterprise funds uh, are the water fund, water reclamation fund, sanitation, sewer maintenance fund, and new development excise tax fund. So the FYE 19 sources of revenue for all funds, we have a uh, 212 million. We have uh, the sources consist of bonds uh, at 42%, the capital sales tax at 20%, user fees at 14%, and the uh, public safety sales tax is at 9%. Uh, there's several other revenue sources in there with a contribution of 5% or less. So within the FYE 19 expenses, uh, the actual projects we have are 436 capital improvement projects. Those are accounting for 93% uh, of the funding and we start uh, clockwise. We have street maintenance at 8%, transportation at 12%, buildings and grounds at 32%, parks and recreation at 10 water reclamation at 6% and then we have the water at 25%. The Capital Improvements Fund, Fund 50, uh, was established in 1976 to account for capital projects funded by capital sales tax receipts, general obligation bond issues, or specific matching funds, such as private and reimbursements. The projects support services that do not have dedicated special revenue, such as enterprise funds, and those projects relating to the enterprise funds funded with fees and charges or special revenue sources are accounted for in their respective um, enterprise funds. So how is Fund 50 funded? We take 70% of 1% of sales tax uh, set aside for capital improvements uh, by referendum in September of 1976. Uh, those projects approved for construction with this funding are accounted for in the Capital Improvements Fund or Fund 50. So the proposed uh, capital sales tax guidelines to allocate for new revenue for next year, we have a general contingency or reserve of 7%. Capital outlay is proposed at uh, 27%. Street maintenance at 25% other projects and debt services, uh, parks, drainage, transportation at 36%, and then um, existing maintenance, existing facility maintenance set at 5%. Anthony, how is that contingency fund decided? I mean, we have contingency funds for everything. So how is it decided at 7%? <clears throat> That's just council's policy and it's part That's of the what, fund balance. That was what was decided some sometime back. Yes, yeah. You actually varied from that a couple of years ago when you used that money to um, supplement the fleet management uh, uh, budget before. But for the most part, you've readopted that policy. So, but it's been an ongoing policy. <clears throat> Councilmember Holman and then Castleberry. 
the, the, <coughs> on Form 50, when it says the 0.7% of sales taxes set aside for capital improvements by mm -hmm. referendum in September 1976, was that does that mean it was a public I mean, vote? Or, or about, so the council <coughs> can't just change that. No. It has to be a public act. Councilmember Casper. On the 7% contingency, is, is is that adequate or you find it too much, too little? I know we've dipped into it a couple of different times on occasions. Or are we certainly going? dipping into it this year. Um, <coughs> it's a prudent policy for most funds. We, we try to set aside 8%. You know, right. we just reestablished that reserve policy for the general fund, but, but it's prudent. But when you say contingency, that's really the fund balance. Yes, sir. That's really it shows more. up in the fund balance. You're saying about seven percent per year to kind of get to that fund balance about eight percent, but we kind of reserve back there for. And so, in the in the fund balance, going to be about sixty six million dollars at the end of the, at the end of the, the audit report. Had that. Well, I know we got stuff in the. In the, in the yeah, so that's a difficult question to answer because for some of the general obligation bond projects, for example, we've got the they cash have. Have. <clears throat> But what's what's kind of the the operating capital fund i know it's about 10 million dollars a year but the general fund the was, seven tenths of a percent no about what do we have kind of in the fund balance that you would say is kind of unreserved um yeah i think that's coming up a little later in the presentation okay. the uh, status of the capital fund as of october 31st 2018 Capital fund PAYGO for FYE 19 estimated available for new projects is uh, 181,000. Previously, this was kept at uh, 1 million. The FYE 20 projected available for new projects will be a negative 3.5. FYE 21 projected fund balance is uh, at a negative uh, 5.8 and continuing negative for future years. And we have the capital fund bonds, bonds reserved. Uh, Bond reserves are unbalanced, and we need to evaluate how to balance those uh, currently unbalanced. We have some significant projects that were closed in FYE 19 between July 1 and October 31st of 18. These uh, are complete and all bills are paid. In the capital fund PAYGO, we had the treasury area, GIS mapping update, Sutton Wilderness uh, dam drainage, the capital fund bonds, we had Main Street in Iowa, which was Barry to Pickard, and Robinson Street, which at 24th Avenue Northeast to 60th Northeast. Councilmember Hitman. Um, two okay. slides back, the, the status of the capital fund. Am I understanding this correctly that you're saying that uh, and maybe it's because it says capital fund pay go, but I'm assuming that's like the capital fund <coughs> projects that we decide each year that we want to do. Are we saying that we are $3.5 million negative, so we're not going to have any money for new projects for FY20? Unless some changes are made, yes. How is that possible? I mean, how, how is the entire capital fund 0.7% or whatever it is uh, already pre-spent for the upcoming year? I mean, I thought we couldn't, for one, I thought we couldn't commit money a year in advance. And, and so just that fundamental question, but then two, how that's $10 million. How are we already $13.5 million upside down? Well, as I understand, you haven't committed the money. Remember, this is a one year budget yeah. and, a, and a four year plan. So if everything follows the plan, which in this case, obviously you hope that it doesn't, then you'd have to, you'd have to cut some projects next year. It's not illegal to have a negative next year in the plan because you're not appropriating money in the plan. But next year, when you when you consider the budget for next year, and I think later on in the presentation, there'll be some discussion about how you might address that. Okay. 
have uh, significant projects completed within FYE 19, but uh, not all bills have been paid. So with federal funding, sometimes the monies have not been distrib distributed, but it's in the process. We had the uh, signal at Alameda and Finley, sidewalks on Boyd, the Boyd University signal, some safe routes to school around Kennedy, we had some wayfinding signage. We also had the Main Street Enhancement Streetscape, 12th Avenue, some additional Highway 9 multimodal path, and we also had the CDBGDR grant infrastructure projects. A couple significant projects underway in FYE 19, the James Garner Phase 1 intersection at Acres and James Garner, PMDL compliance and monitoring plan, Fire Station 9, and then we have the comprehensive plan update. So here's a, a, just a couple pictures of the James Garner Avenue Phase 1. Uh, you'll note on Phase 2, that is uh, currently in engineering and design stage. And we will uh, be looking to have federal funding for <coughs> Phase 2. Councilmember Casper. Is phase two in Norwood Ford? Yes. yes. Projects under construction for FYE 19 and 20. Councilmember Hickman has a question. Sorry. Uh, Just back. a quick follow up on that James Garner question. Did the James, did the uh, Norman Ford budget include uh, dollars to acquire the land up by the water tower as a part of that James Garner extension flyover from the university? There is money for right-of-way acquisition. I can't say that it was anticipating that particular piece of land, but, but there is money for land acquisition. Councilmember Holman. <clears throat> Doesn't Norman Forward account uh, or have a budget that would fully fund the project without federal funding? And if we get federal funding that pays for half of it, then we have $3 million or something. That's, that's another big cost-saving project that we were had our hopes on a little bit thinking okay if we can get federal funding for that we'll have a some money left over to go towards other stuff or land acquisition if we need to or other projects and on forth Jane I know you're waiting to see who doesn't have a hand up uh, so the projects under construction for FYE 19 and 20, uh, just to highlight a few, we had the West Main uh, Bridge, West Main Street Bridge over 10 Mile Flat, Legacy Trail Extension, uh, Pass and Boulevard Sidewalks, I mean there's several on here. So uh, on we have the uh, 24th Avenue East widening project. Part of this is that so the north piece would be in Ward 6, the south piece would be in Ward 1. This was approved through the 2012 bond and just to note that there's never been a two mile <coughs> corridor done before in one, one proposal. We have the 36th Avenue um, to Kempster Road to Indian Hills project, which would be widening two miles of roadway from two to four lane. Improves access to Ruby Grant Park. We have the I-35 and I-35 and Robinson Street uh, West Side. So this is in the pipeline for fall of 19, and there are UNP TIF funds uh, appropriated and planned for, in addition to a four million dollar uh, federal funding match for this area. <clears throat> We have the Tempster Road, 24th Avenue, uh, Flood Avenue project. So there were several things to outline on this project. Um, ACOG ranked this as a top prior priority for funding. Um, this was identified in the transportation plan. Um, however, there are uh, not adequate TIF fund monies um, <coughs> for this project, so financing needs to be discussed on how to move forward with this area, improvement for this area. Councilmember Holman. 
these two projects not eligible to be paid for by the developer? Um, the west side of I-35 and Robinson probably is not. Um, I that's meant to come so. But the Tecumseh come so probably is. So these two these two projects could be potentially funded by the developer and not by. In, in, in development agreement number one, there was some recognition of uh, intersections that flood and also on 24th of Tecumseh. So that is in development agreement number one. So. And if we use all of our 11.55 million, there is an argument, a fairly strong one, that they would be responsible to pay for, to pay for those additional costs. Even if we end the TIF Well, tax. Uh, again, the TIF is really a funding source. So right. as long as we uh, as long as the don't breach the agreements, then uh, as long as we do our part of the agreement, then they should be required to do their part as well. Okay. They decided to do that. Yeah. Yes, Council Member Castleberry and then Hickman. So, what source of funds are we using or looking at for this? <coughs> I mean, you got, you got the budget. I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> let me chime in here. Okay. If I can. Um, so, about a $7 million project, about two and a half million or four and a half million would be federal funds. As Jane mentioned, this project ranked really high last year because it's so needed. If, if we travel this area, this is one of our most congested locations, one of our most high accident locations, and it's growing rapidly, very, very rapidly. Uh, partially because of University of North Park, but also because of development in the area. Um, so we need to come up with 2.7 million local. And certainly agree with what Mr. Bryant said. The problem that you're going to face is you need those funds in this next fiscal year to make the project meet the schedule to get the federal funds. So um, we need to really begin that negotiation pretty quickly with the UNT developers to get that 2.7 million or some portion of it in the capital fund or council uh, make it up with your capital fund uh, dollars that you, that you might choose to apply there. The problem here that, though is that this project is moving quickly because the federal funds are so highly ranked. It, it, it ranks number one in OKC Metro. So if you'd like to do it next year or the, in the federal 2020, um, we need to come up with that local share in the next year. So, I mean, how, how does that negotiation go? I mean, hey, Mr. Developer, would you please write us a check in the next six months? Or, I mean, do you approach? I mean, you said we got to get this going. I mean, what's, what's the process, I guess? Well, well, we'll talk about development agreement number one, but as last year when we knew this was coming, that was one of the additional <coughs> traffic and roadway improvement funding items that would have been included in an amendment to the TIF revenue project. But without adding that, we need to look for another source, either try to convince the, uh, the developer to pay that share. There, we may have some difficulty because uh, some of this design is more extensive than just where the tip boundaries are drawn. Right. So uh, we're just going to have to work through them and see what kind of cooperation we can do. Council Member Hickman. My recollection that was that there was about I don't know, a little less than 500 grand left of approved project costs for road improvements in the TIF. That's correct. Uh, and so I guess just, uh, you know, to kind of help move the needle, you know, should we allocate, appropriate, whatever the right term is, Anthony, that 500 grand, if we thought that was a, I mean, unless it's, I don't know if it's committed to something else, but if we said earmarked that money for this to come to our project and said, we've checked the box, we've spent our 11 point whatever million that's required by the TIF document, because now we've spent the last 500,000 towards this, you know, so that 2.7, we put in 500 grand, that's going to go towards whatever is the more city type stuff, not the TIF type stuff. So when you sit down with them to say, okay, now it's 2.7 and here's what it goes to, here's what the costs are for the TIF part, um, that might at least help in those negotiations and discussions. And then allows us to say, we have maxed out, you know, and done our part. I don't know if there are other road projects. I just throw that out there as an idea that that seems to me that would maybe help move the needle and help in those in negotiations. Good suggestion.
an outline of the ODOT projects for State Highway 9 and 18 mile corridor. We have um, phase one, uh, 24th Avenue East to 36th Avenue, project completed. Uh, phase two, 36th Avenue East to 72nd, project completed. <coughs> Phase three is the 72nd Avenue East to 108th Avenue, uh, construction scheduled for 2022. And a future phase out at 156th for 2024. The Little River Bridge is under construction right now. And then uh, phase five uh, is the 108th to 156th four lane undivided rural section for 2025. The Fund 15 of uh, public safety sales tax projects underway would be the amended. Council Member Wilson. I'm sorry. I, I just, uh, what was our port? What's the city's portion of the Little River Bridge? That says a $6 million figure on it, but. <clears throat> it's all funded by the state. It's all funded yes. by the state. No, no city involvement. That's correct. All of these projects are fully funded <coughs> by the state. There's a minor portion of city funds that are requested for utility relocation. Very small numbers. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so the PSS uh, PSST tax uh, projects underway in FYE 19. We have the Emergency Communications Center. The design is complete. Obviously, we've not started construction, but the design has been uh, completed. And there's a fire apparatus replacement, and there is a correction on that. It should be year four, not year three. I apologize on that. And the same thing for uh, fire apparatus replacement under the upcoming significant projects for FYE 20. That should actually be year five. There's nine years listed in the book, and, and going back and double checking these, we believe that that should be year five. <coughs> under Fund 51, Norman Forward completed. Uh, this does say uh, completed in FYE 19. We did put Westwood Pool. We wanted to be able to at least get a picture in there. So we have uh, Westwood Pool on there. And we have the library East Branch and then Sonoma Park renovation. And then we've got the picture of Westwood there. We wanted to that plug. <laughs> We have additional Fund 51 Norman Forward underway, which is uh, the, the staff time is being invested on these, not necessarily uh, under, under construction or anything. For example, the indoor aquatic facility and indoor sports facility, there's a design and land, land acquisition. We have the Andrew Par Andrews Park improvements, Ruby Grant development, Saxon Park development. And then under the Fund 51 Norman Forward upcoming in uh, FYE 20, we have uh, the, again the indoor aquatic facility, indoor sports facility, Reeves Park remodel, and then a, a Ruby Grant Park. Under the FYE 2017 through 2021 street maintenance bond program, this being year three of the five year cycle. We'll be looking forward to a 2020 to 2021 for voter approval for another five-year program on this. A couple uh, photos, some of the uh, areas, Walnut Road, we have an urban asphalt, Thistlewood Drive, urban concrete, Lahoma, a reconstruction, then Imhoff, 180th Avenue, southeast to west end. So in the 2012 Transportation Stormwater Bond Program, on this list here that you see on this slide, the first four projects, so the Cedar Lane, Lindsay Street, Franklin Road, and the 12th Avenue, those uh, first four are completed. We have the Main Street Bridge uh, and under 2018 here, which is underway. Under the 2019-2020 24th Avenue, uh, Lindsay Street, uh, Robinson Street, we do have funding for those for that project. And then on the last two, the uh, 36th Avenue, Northwest, and Alameda Street projects, the funding is discussed on this slide. 
<coughs> so um, as we know, the Lindsay Street project uh, did go over budget. However, there are remaining projects here that you see on this slide uh, that are at or below the budgeted, uh, which would allow us to make up the difference from uh, from the previous screen on these last uh, last projects there for 36th and uh, Alameda. But we need to discuss with council um, how we would allocate these funds, uh, possibly under the to transfer of surplus funds from the 2010 street maintenance bond program and then transfer surplus funds from the 2016 street maintenance bond program um, there should be a surplus in there that we could make up some monies council member castleberry so the 2010 to 2016 street maintenance program they're not done <laughs> Why is there a surplus? Yes. There? So 2010 is uh, just recently completed. Okay. Uh, that was on Iowa and Dakota and so on in the core area. And there's a uh, there's a 19 million dollar program. We came in right at 16 million, so there's about 3.1 million in, in uh, funds left over in that program. We have completed all 230 projects that were obligated, and that's part of the, the discussion point here. It's a staff proposal for you all to consider, and that is you could take we think you could take two million of that 3.1 million transfer it over to the 2012 bond program and begin to cut into that deficit. <clears throat> Councilor Hickman, this was the point earlier, why the fund 50 is showing a shortage in next year, in the future year, it's in the 2012 bond program deficit. So the proposal here is to make up that deficit with other sources of funds except the capital fund. You could do that also, you could just tap into your capital fund and start canceling other projects. We're offering this as an alternative to that. We'd like for you to keep your capital program going at the current level, but you have to make up the 5.8 million that was spent on Lindsay. So what happens with this 3.1 million? If we don't do anything, it just sits there, right? Correct. And, and typically, <coughs> council has directed the staff project. to do additional street maintenance projects, so we could find another 3.1 million in and rural road projects and urban projects. There's, there's plenty of work to do. We could find plenty of projects to build, and you certainly could do that. That's really what it was for. The bond council has said that you could also use street maintenance uh, surplus funds to augment your other bond program that is falling short. We think that's a good idea. We think it's a, a prudent approach. We think the 2016 program, which is in year three, is on the same track that the 2010 was. So we think you're going to come in under on that one as well. Things are going well. Those bids are doing well. Projects are going well. So we uh, don't want to count our chickens before they're hatched. But what we're really looking forward from you tonight is just your feedback about this concept of, of making up the revenue shortfall or the local shortfall in the 2012 bond program so that we can just keep moving along. No project has been delayed, but 36 Avenue is coming up next year, and you're going to have to make some kind of decision. Right. So that, that needs to be well, done. The 16 one, the million and a half, <laughs> we're still in, in the middle of that project. Correct. Right. Is that our, quote, surplus to date? That or is, is that what you anticipate is going to be projected frankly, out? Our, our projection today is a little higher than this. So okay. We're taking a more conservative approach. <clears throat> but you're this right. Is not all of it. This is not all of it. It's a portion of it. Right. Okay. Council Member Holman. Um, I, I definitely like what I see here with these proposed options um, that looks good to me it makes sense um, would you be able to give us just a refresher maybe on the factors and why the Lindsay Street project is so far over budget and it's a mega project everybody happy understands that no, so. that's fine happy to um, long story but let me kind of summarize it and Scott can back me up if I get off the rails here but the majority of it was in land acquisition, <clears throat> much higher cost than anticipated. Uh, <clears throat> and the biggest chunk of it was, it frankly, it was a policy change at ODOT. When we, when council was sitting around this table in 2011 and 2012 and prior to the bond election, our concept called for the discharge of all that stormwater underground right into the I-35 right of way on, on uh, just south of Lindsay Street. Uh, ODOT decided after the bond election that that was not acceptable. So we had to bury a mile of underground pipeline all the way to the Canadian River and acquire all the right-of-way to do that. <coughs> About a five or six million dollar shift. 
it was the first phase of the project. So we as a design team were thinking, well, we have to do this. We have to get this built. And you might also recall that that's when ODOT was rebuilding I, I, uh, uh, Highway 9 and 35. So we had to get that box under the highway while they were there. So things were pretty, uh, were moving pretty quickly. We knew that it was coming in higher. Frankly, we didn't know it was going to be this high until the end of the project. We were hoping to make it up. But it was, it was, there's not a lot of fluff in this. Let me just offer that. These were what you promised the citizens on Lindsay Street that you were going to do. We didn't do any more. We didn't do any less. But what we did cost a lot more than we expected. So really factors that beyond our control and ones that couldn't have been predicted by the council back then. I don't think, think so, so, nor I think staff. And, and again, I don't mean to pick on ODOT, but it was a policy, a, a major policy shift. We argued and we begged them not to do it. But we lost the argument and we had to build a project. And so um, that's what happened. And we, you know, throughout the project, as we went along from there, we continued to make decisions mm -hmm. on the project that were consistent with the, the promise to the voters. Underground Electric came in twice as high. We thought that was a million dollar project. It was a two million dollar project. We never anticipated some of those issues with OG and E. And so it was things like that. that the project, it was just a very expensive very complex project. One of a kind, yeah. One of a kind. But I also would say, um, I think we delivered a really good project. I think the final product is, is what council promised the community. And now we just have to make up the difference in, in the remainder of the program. I appreciate the explanation. Okay. Council Member Wilson. Oh, never mind. Thank you. Kind of answered my question. <clears throat> I want to make sure that council's kind of okay with the concept here, you know. I, I I think it makes perfect sense. We don't we don't want to get slowed down because then we just have more money the following year to make up. So I think. So the next slide uh, simply outlines the ACOG distribution of federal funding. <coughs> And then we're highlighting the city vehicle replacement program. Uh, in 2017, there was a, a shift, as you can see, but there was a vehicle study uh, completed, which showed the city was behind in replacing some of the vehicles. So that's why there's the shift in the 2017 FYE. <clears throat> that was the one year that you changed your contingency policy. Under Fund 23 room tax and upcoming significant projects consist of the Firehouse Art Center addition, which is $100,000 with a match with a capital campaign, historic music museum parking lot will be $65,000, and the Sooner Theater interior renovations continues on, which uh, there's been the seat replacement, bathroom remodels, dressing room renovations. Council Member Hickman. On the historic museum, uh, the parking, I know that they also have some uh, meaningful uh, repairs and updates or, you know, repair issues, I guess I'll say, that need to be uh, addressed. And I, I, I don't know how much our Parks Department has looked into that. I think there's been some conversations, but um, I know that the parking is also important. But, you know, if the museum starts having structure problems, that's probably more important than parking. And But I don't know. I guess I just want to interject that I think that's something that we need to look at ensuring we have uh, adequate funds to, to take care of that facility. I think facility. Judd may have some comments. Right, yes, we are We are aware of those issues and we'll, we are preparing a, a capital budget project request to address them. We're gonna try to address some of the more uh, critical issues just in other ways with, with money that we can scrape together here and there. But we are aware of it and we'll be putting a project together. Yeah. Thanks, Judd. For the Fund 50, capital upcoming significant projects in FYE 20, we have the 201 West Gray Building A generator, we have a uh, security system replacement and expansion, police range burn renovation, the uh, ASS parking uh, project, Uh, upcoming, continuing on, we have 36th Avenue, Cedar Lane, uh, Highway 9, right-of-way utilities, Flood Avenue, Multimodal Path, 
Rock Creek Road, traffic signals, intersection widening at 12th Avenue. For the Fund 50 Capital upcoming uh, recurring sidewalk projects in FYE 20. Sidewalk programs for schools and arterials, accessibility projects, downtown area sidewalk project, sidewalks and trails, and then the saw cut program. For Fund 50 Capital upcoming recurring projects in FYE 20, street maintenance, and there's a whole list, stormwater drainage maintenance, ADA sidewalk compliance repair, uh, traffic calming, green belt acquisition, for the upcoming challenge, oh, sorry. Council Mayor yes. Wilson. <clears throat> the street striping is that new stripes or replacement stripes? Councilor, <laughs> uh, you all added this. You've not typically done capital funding for street striping, so you augmented our operating budget with this additional fifty thousand, and we use this primarily to place stripes and or five packages. <laughs> goes into that that area of Norman. We'll put that one as a win for Savita. We just have if you're not thinking on work right, we just have way way more miles of roads to strike there than we do anywhere else. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Councilmember Hickman. I, I just want to I don't see uh, um, on the, the list and I just I think it's important that we we talk about it or we include it or um, we don't forget about it. I know that um, we just spent a lot of time doing the uh, ADA compliance study, uh, and I'd like for us to consider having a more meaningful line item in our capital funds project to uh, start addressing some of those issues. Um, and I know there's, I see $100,000 here for ADA sidewalk compliance and repair, and um, but, you know, I think that study looked at, you know, you know, I know that there were things about, you know, how the traffic buttons are pushed to, to cross the streets and, um, you know, park access. And uh, I mean, we think it would be nice to see a, a more robust allocation of dollars to further <coughs> move along in implementation of that plan. Appreciate it. We'll be happy to bring that back to you in February. And, and that's, again, it is a work in progress with our new ADA technician coming on board in January and the committee and so on. So we'll, we'll make sure we bring that to you for your next discussion. And one thing that would need to be pointed out is that in a lot of projects that aren't called ADA, there's a large ADA component in a lot of those projects. And you might just want to highlight that. For example, the municipal complex renovation we're about to undertake, a lot of that project is ADA compliant. So just well, and won't that. some of them be in the streets projects as well? Exactly. Same as Anthony said, Mayor, that there's so many things that we do that are part of that whole compliance And the plan. parks, the Norman exactly. Forward, a lot of the ADA uh, projects are in the, already in the Norman Forward plans. I think, too, your citizen committee that I suspect will be formed here, I, I hope this year um, in FY19, will then start to bring their recommendations and, and uh, uh, requests to you on an annual basis starting next year. It's really what we anticipate happening there. So noting the upcoming challenges, several here. We have the future uh, stormwater utility fee election, I-35 corridor study, Griffin land uh, acquisition, several. Uh, the last one there, we have the uh, fire station number 10. Fire station number 10 was planned, I guess, for the Destin landing area. The land is available, but the uh, personnel that would be needed to uh, be at the, at the station is uh, not included. PSST did not include uh, or did not cover station 10. So that's something that has to be mm -hmm. talk talked about as well. And then in addition to that, uh, dealing with several, several of these projects that have a, a capital element to them as well. <clears throat> Just to throw off for your consideration, you know, there's another alternative that you might think about for that Tecumseh Road project. If you're <coughs> unsuccessful with getting the developer to pay or renegotiate that that obligation you could include that in the in the 2019 transportation bond if you deem that to be a higher priority than some of the projects that are in there then that's one thing you could do 
Also, as you're considering amendments to the TIF project plan, you could reallocate projects within the project plan. You, you know, for example, uh, you could say instead of having 8.75 million for the cultural facility, you're going to have 6 million for the cultural facility and have 2 million for uh, Tecumseh. You would reallocate that to the road uh, improvements. That's one thing you could consider. So for the next steps, um, we'll have a meeting January 26, 2019, discussion on proposed new projects. Following up again with the April 23rd, uh, 2019, which will be the review of the final proposed plan for FYE 2020. Council Member Holman. Back on the fire station issue, was, I recall, wasn't part of Norm, or the PSST Relocate fire station number five uh, out by Little X. Yes, sir. is that where where we at? Um, I think it's in the capital plan. Is it out five years? They don't have to staff because it's already staffed. Sorry, You're yeah. just moving it, relocating it. We we are still that project is still moving. It's still in the plan. Yes, sir. Okay. It's the yeah. last of the critical capital need projects. Is, are you, am I hearing you say that your the plan is to move num, fire station number five in where? I don't know if the chief is here. Chief is here. We were looking at near the Clear Bay entrance off Highway 9. So a lot of that district's population is in that area. Strategically having access to the lake was advantageous from an operational perspective. So that's there what we were looking at. But once that uh, process gets going, like Anthony said, Later in the 2020s, we present a plan that would obviously be approved by council. Okay, thank you. Council thank Member you. Hitman. Chief King, well, I guess while you're up, uh, do we provide uh, serv fire uh, service uh, on the University of Oklahoma campus? Yes, we do. Uh, do. Do they have their own fire department? They do not. Do they contribute any money to our fire department's budget? We get reimbursed on game days for about three positions of overtime that we would call in to support. Uh, do we do we track where the fire uh, calls are to, to to know if they're on campus or off campus? With our new uh, records keeping software, we're better able to look at that. We can't hone in directly uh, because it's based on uh, zip codes, but we we know that our fire station three is very busy and we make a lot of calls on campus. So could we potentially quantify the value of the calls that the Norman Fire Department makes to the University of Oklahoma's campus? I think we can drill down as we continue to learn our software and, and get a real good mm -hmm. estimate to the mm -hmm. annual call basis there, yes. Thank you. I'll try to work on that. Okay, thank you. Council Member Beerman. So um, maybe I'm getting to the project request part. Um, and this is kind of twofold. Um, as the council liaison on the animal welfare oversight committee, we had our meeting on Monday and they were detailing the very significant problems they're having with our brand new shelter. Uh, the HVAC system in a number of ways is not working properly. It being situated so close uh, to the wastewater treatment plant, uh, it's corroding inside this system. It's 53 tons. It's going to cost $2,000 per ton to get it coated properly so that it doesn't continue to degrade. On top of that, the dehumidifier and the actual air conditioning systems are working against each other because they weren't installed properly and the roof is leaking. Our brand new shelter has a leaking roof. Um, so I would like to see if we could find the budget to address those problems. And then I would also like us to think twice about utilizing these contractors in the future, specifically the HVAC company, the roofer, and frankly, the general contractor. Uh, who's the one who's supposed to be pointing out all of these problems before they become serious problems three years down the road and are going to cost us even more money to fix. And they should never have happened in the first place. Um, so I know that that's kind of both sides of it. We do have, we do have projects that need to happen at the shelter. And on top of that, we have some contractors that have left us with some pretty shoddy work and I'm not at all pleased that we're going to be having to pay to fix their mistakes. Final comments? Uh, 
sorry. Okay. If, if there are other things that I want staff to consider to be included, do you want to hear those now? Yes. Now or certainly in the next 30 to 60 days. Okay. I mean, because I, you know, I, I know I've mentioned, I think, to some of y'all that I'd like for us to consider the Alameda intersection, which maybe is a part of the Porter project that we're talking about, Sean, I don't know. Uh, and then the Gray Street parking lot, um, making that to be something that can be you go ahead and be utilized as opposed to being a rock, you know, gravel, you know, a uh, lot right now on the, on the west side of Gray Street. Well, I don't like the idea of adding more surface parking. I think in the short term with the redevelopment of West <coughs> Main Street, uh, I've had several businesses say that they need parking. And, you know, I don't know if we, I don't think it benefits us to, to uh, leave that sitting there unused. And, you know, I know it'll cost a little bit of money to make it usable and accessible, but I think that's something worth, worth us discussing and considering. Council Member Castleberry. I guess it would be in this capital part of this, but, you know, um, in, in Norman Ford, basically our, our legacy park anyway, I guess is in the TIF area. You know, we, um, the oversight committee recommended before additional parking out there. And we had kind of talked over the past couple of years about having some parking on the west, north, kind of northwest corner over there by the bathroom. So I'd like to see us look. I think they've got a major recommendation for us to do that. But basically put some parking over there. I think it's 30 stalls total, maybe. But like two were handicapped and the rest of them. And I'd like to see at least half of that be handicapped. Yeah. And then the rest of it just kind of be regular parking. I think it's only like ninety-five thousand dollars. I mean, that was the original budget. I mean, there I may thought be some we had talked during. about that before. Well, we've talked about it, but we never have actually pulled the trigger on it. So and it's so, not been in the budget. Yeah, and so I think it's you know, and I know we've had some timing difference issues of when it's gone in there. I mean, obviously the capital fund is, is pretty close to negative anyway, but I think this would actually be something that would I would like to see that put into the capital fund, whether that's in the UNP fund or fifty. And yeah, that would be my question: Is do you want to? to do it out of the capital fund or out of the, the TIF, TIF fund, fund is what because I thought we'd talk about. There is money. If it's an eligible project out of the TIF fund, I'd like to use TIF fund money to do it. Yeah, I, think that's I thought that's what we'd talk about. That, because that was part of the, the park. We had some savings in the park, and so it seems like we ought to utilize those funds for the area that they were allocated for. And I definitely agree with the ADA. We've heard a lot from the disabilities community about functions activities that happen out there and not being able to get enough uh, I don't want to go the whole thing parking. as handicap I don't think you need 30 spots out there but I think you know two would be the normal requirement but I'd like to see maybe you know plus five times that you know 10 or 15 out there uh, for that area I know there's plenty of parking out there but I think we need to emphasize the, the handicap part of that and then you know, there are some people that don't qualify quote as handicap stickers you know, but would like to park a little closer that are a little bit elderly or have some. So are you suggesting just kind of look the other way on those folks? No, 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 I'm saying, no, I'm saying sometimes when you're, sometimes when you're on crutches or, you know, you, you, you get around, so you don't technically have a handicap sticker, but you could easily get one. You just don't, you're kind of stubborn or whatever. I think close parking would be beneficial for those type of people in addition to the people that actually really do need, you He's know. talking about old people like me that want to get there early so we don't have to walk so far. Well, I think that's part of, I mean, I don't want it to just be people that are lazy, but I think it needs to be something that's not necessarily, two, two spots is not enough. But I don't think it needs to be 30. I don't you know, have an empty parking lot over there. You're going to have a bunch of people parking there illegally. And so I'd like to see maybe half of it. Or, you know. And the second question would be, you don't have to wait for the budget on that one because it is. it can come right out of the tip. We can take it out now. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. There was a commitment in development order five mm -hmm. for 175000 They set aside for parking, but that parking was actually supposed to be over that kitchen right. facility. Uh, but there was another suggestion several years ago that we haven't come off of Interstate 35. I think that was the, uh, the frontage road. Uh, I think that was the chart that was given to the PIP Oversight Committee today. Council, prior council looked at that and said, no. said, no, they don't really want to do it. So I, you know, I think I would suggest that we bring that schematic back right. to you guys 
and certainly frame future councils. So, but if that's because of changing circumstances, you want to do it, uh, that'd be fine. I would suggest we bring that schematic back or at least circulate it. Get yeah. something to the city manager that you want to uh, I definitely like to revisit that. And then my last question would be, Jane, uh, on the funds you listed, we didn't list Center City. Does Center City TIF not have its own fund? There's just not anything in there? Or how do we account for Center City funds? There is a fund. They're the only funds that were um, appropriated <laughs> to the Center City TIF fund were that the, the matching funds for the legal upfront work. So it's kind of a fund waiting for a project, basically. So there's no, there's no money in it. So there's, there, there's been no um, incremental gotcha. appropriations, and there has been no project, at least to date. But it's, we'll, either, it's either this year or next will there be year. Will be some next year? There'll be some. There should Matt be some Avalor and increment that should be paying over to. It should be this year, right? Uh, yeah, we, we, we did it purposely to get it done before the end of the year so we'd get increment from this year. It may be kidding. I'll, I'll double January. check that for sure. Uh, probably is due this year payment. I think we can pay it December 31st. First. I think the payment's usually in March. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. But we'll double check that for sure. But there should be some increment. It should start out. That's what I thought so. Thank you. Councilmember Holman. Uh, I agree with. ADA parking at Legacy Park. Um, that I prefer the lot be made it not the whole thing, but at least more than a definitely more than the minimum of spaces. And I don't want to make the parking lot too big either. I don't, you know, I don't, like, parking everywhere around there. Um, and those of us that are able can walk 100 feet from Academy's parking lot, which isn't for Academy, it's for everybody. Um, so I support that for sure. I definitely support. Uh, project to uh, for the West Gray Street parking lot on the property the city owns right now across the street from here. Um, I agree that West Main is blowing up a little bit right now, and parking has become a little scarce. So I agree with that. Um, the one there's only really one project in Ward Seven that I would uh, like us to consider for some funding, and that is a sidewalk project on Brook Street uh, from Classen to Trout, basically. Um, that's the only urban railroad crossing in Norman that does not have a sidewalk crossing. If we if we are able to get the uh, Constitution project in this transportation bond, that will fix that one. And then Brooks will be the only remaining railroad crossing in the city park urban area that does not have uh, sidewalks on either side, actually. And if you go down there, there's a you know significant uh, rut in the rut mm -hmm. on the sides from people walking, you know. And um, uh, so I would like to see us uh, consider that as a project. I know there's some difficulty with the grade there, but um, that's and that's kind of a Ward 7 and a Ward 4 yeah. deal. So that's it. Thank you. Wilson. Um, if we're asking for stuff, um, <laughs> Get out what's the plan for connecting the Highway 9, the little new section of sidewalk to Saxon Park? Down 36, I guess. No plan. I'm saying the look on the face. Right, and Angela's right. So the, the 36th Avenue bond project that's in your 2019 program would include sidewalk and, and bike lane with it. So that project gets added to the. So all the way to program. Cedar Lane, or? Yes. You're, all the way to Cedar yes, Lane. Yes, all the way to Cedar Lane. Correct. And of course, Cedar Lane would have a continuous sidewalk and bike lane leading so the there. Bridge on the other and that project. whole that whole mile. Okay. Right. I like that plan. It's hard to get it done. <laughs> Another win for Sarita. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, I'm going to move on to item number three is consideration of adjourning into executive session as authorized by Oklahoma statutes in order to discuss the acquisition of real property for recreational purposes. This is what we're going to talk about when we come back okay. out. We'll we'll move. Come back out. Second. We'll come back out and oh, somebody already. I have motioned it. Okay. Well, they didn't. They didn't hear the whole thing. But. So we'll be coming back. From we'll be coming back, and then we'll and then we'll do this. And Judd. Foster and Terry Floyd will be giving the presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, appreciate the opportunity here. 
we're going to do uh, a presentation that covers uh, overview of the current operation, real quick history of that, and um, uh, how we worked on uh, our model that we've used for different site options before. We'll talk about the different mm -hmm. options uh, that we have have uh, looked into and uh, given to you all through uh, your packet information. And then briefly um, about the wellness center option, which I think is recent discussion uh, here at the council level, um, like the uh, model that's being used in Oklahoma City. Um, the, uh, of course, the current uh, senior center is an old Carnegie library. It was built in 1929. Um, it was remodeled where a kitchen and um, uh, dining room facility was added on in 77, and then uh, the kitchen was expanded in, in 1980. Uh, it's just under 13,000 square feet total, and the footprint of the building is it's on about an acre of land. Um, we have 34 parking places right adjacent to the, to the building, and another roughly 20 um, parallel spaces on Sims, um, uh, which is just to the south side. Uh, that is clearly one of the main issues of the building. Um, uh, parking is, has been identified. Everyone's aware of, of, uh, of that being a, a constraint on the current facility. Um, so in looking at uh, sites for uh, a standalone senior center, um, we started some public discussions. Uh, we had several meetings with some of the senior groups at the senior center. And then you may recall we had a consulting team uh, here uh, prior to the 2015 Norman Forward vote um, and had uh, some meetings where we gathered input on programming uh, from seniors. And then that input was used by the consulting team to size a building. So in other words, to do all the programming you've identified, we, we need a building of about 21,000 square feet. And that was... That was basically everything that got identified with the exception of a pool, uh, as, as I recall. So we've been using that 21,000 square foot as a size to um, look for um, that we would need to accommodate with about 100 parking spaces um, and, and looking for something, um, uh, sites that would accommodate those facilities. Um, the um, the current facility um, that we have is run with one full-time and one permanent part-time staff. Uh, Norman Forward calls for an additional part full-time staff uh, whenever we were, would uh, build a new facility. And um, uh, so we've used that kind of a model in terms of um, looking at the various site options. There are other models and we'll talk about that too briefly. Uh, a little bit later. Um, so in your packet, um, you have a matrix, this matrix uh, of information. These are the five different options that we see uh, that are that may be viable options. Some are better than others, um, in our opinion. Um, and these are the pros and cons that have been kind of summarized. Um, I'm going to go through these individually. I know that's kind of hard to read up on the screen there. It's, it's pretty small. So we're going to go through them individually. Um, and talk about the sites and the pros and cons as we see it um, for each location. I think that um, that's going to help you um, in terms of uh, uh, moving towards a, a decision on a location. Um, option number one uh, is at Reeves Park. Um, this has been talked about before. Um, the uh, picture here on the screen shows Reeves Park. Uh, you can see uh, Jenkins is – do I have a pointer? Um, oh, I guess I can do it on here. Sure. Uh, Jenkins is here, um, and Constitution down here. This is the west boundary of the park. Jenkins and Constitution is the south boundary of the park. This little uh, blue rectangle is the area we're talking about, and the, the, the triangular-shaped white structure you see there is the uh, existing, uh, we call it Reeves Center, uh, the building that for many years we taught dance classes out of and uh, garden clubs have met there and uh, other source, uh, uh, other uses like that. Occasionally uh, uh, special events use it um, that are at the park. 
there was a time <clears throat> a few years ago when the uh, current senior center was being renovated the restrooms were being renovated and we had to close the building down for a while for a couple of months i think and this site was used as a temporary location for the seniors to gather each day um, and the feedback that we got was very positive um, they liked the location um, in terms of the location of it, this building certainly isn't large enough by any stretch but but they did uh, we did receive a lot of positive comments about the location uh, being favorable um, this is an overlay of the Reeves Park master plan that you just adopted not too long ago. Um, this shows uh, an arbitrary footprint of a building. Uh, again, this is all just to show spatial um, uh, possibilities. This one happens to be 22,000 square feet with a parking uh, around it on three sides of 120 spaces. Um, you can see that <coughs> This is overlaid on the master plan, and it, it displaces very little of the master plan. We'd have to rearrange a few of the sidewalks, um, but otherwise, uh, other than taking a little bit of the green space away, um, it works there. It could fit there within the current master plan that we have adopted for Reeves. Um, so, Councilmember Holman. Yes, gentlemen. Uh, with that... Uh, conceptual placement would that interfere with the plans that uh, Mabel Fair, you know, since they were involved in the design sure. process? Yeah, good question. And we certainly would need to check with them. Um, my opinion is uh, probably not. It, it would, they, they probably would appreciate the extra parking space and maybe be able to use that for, for something. We would need to check with them for sure. But um, I think that they would still be able to do the the fair as we know it, um, and it, certainly as it's as the park is planned, um, would I would anticipate they'd be able to um, work with this. We would we would need to let them speak for themselves on that, but uh, I would expect that it would be a workable solution for the fair. I think the fair could continue to go on. Thank you. Um, so some of the pros and cons for this site. Um, of course, the land is available. We own it already. There's no acquisition costs involved uh, or lease costs or anything like that. Um, it would accommodate phased construction if we chose to do that. The, there would be a way to uh, expand that space if we wanted to build part of it now and add on to it later, for example. Um, so potentially we could, we could add on. Um, lower site development costs here than at Andrews Park and some of the others. And I'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but you'll recall uh, some of our previous discussions about Andrews Park. Um, there's some drainage issues. Part of it's in the floodplain. Uh, we would have to go through a loamer uh, process and uh, somewhere just under about a million dollars worth of uh, drainage improvements at the Andrews site, for example. So there's money that we would have to spend there that we wouldn't have to spend here um, as one example. Councilmember Hickman. Well, never mind. I'll ask when we get to the Andrews Park site. So um, uh, central location, um, that's that's a positive thing. And uh, as far as the negative side, um, there would be some demolition cost of the existing building. I think that would be pretty minimal in the, in the big picture uh, of this project, but uh, uh, it would be cost that would have to be borne by the or part of the project. Uh, uh, so moving on, uh, option number two uh, is the Ruby Grant site. Uh, this is uh, an image of the uh, current master plan work or, or construction document work that's underway now. Um, it's a little bit squished from top to bottom, so it's a little distorted on the screen. So uh, it's, it's more of a square shape. But, but anyway, the project area is in the southwest corner. It's shaded there in, in kind of a yellow color there. Um, and you can see that, that the park plan, as it's drawn now, um, has a large wide open space in that southwest corner and very large and could accommodate <coughs> a number of uh, options there. Um, over on the far left, uh, down in the far left corner, you see some parking lots that are proposed. The first phase of the Ruby Grant project will propose to build 
uh, a portion of this parking and then it'll be added on to uh, in a later phase. But um, anyway, that's parking there, a playground that we've talked about. The, the accessible playground is, area is here generally. <coughs> All of this is, is open and available. So we went to our, um, our design team that's working on... Uh, how, how does the size of this one compare to um, uh, Sutton Wilderness? Same size. This is, this is actually a few acres smaller just because we lose a few acres on the, uh, where the um, uh, frontage road is on I-35. But otherwise, it's, it's a quarter section. Okay. Councilmember Castleberry. Jen, on this overlay here, does this interfere with the cross country? So, uh, 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 Not at all. Or? Not at all. The, uh, the cross, the competitive cross country facility, this would be the start area right here. You can see that triangular shape. That's kind of the, the starting run out. And then it meanders up this way. This is. So it looks like the green area, it does kind of mess with the start area. Is that. No, this, this is a, this trail is um, a paved walking trail, not part of the cross-country facility. This, this trail here. And you may point out, Joe, as we get to some of the, just some conceptual ideas, how those are implemented okay. together on, in, in a few slides. Okay, I'm sorry. So, yeah, so um, we asked our consultants and told them that, hey, is this, would this be an option here? And one of the uh, sub-consultants uh, was involved in the uh, uh, Mitch Park YMCA uh, project in Edmond where they have a competitive pool and, and YMCA building. And so he, he got the footprint of that building, which is, is here. And um, so the, the competitive pool at Mitch Park is in this part of the building. And then this other part on the left side is the YMCA structure. So we put that on there just again for spatial reasons, just to show that a competitive pool and gymnasium, in our case, the multipurpose facility, could fit on this site. Um, this piece is, you may or may not recognize, but you'll see in a minute, this is the an arbitrary shape and size of a 21,000 square foot senior center that we proposed at one time at Andrews Park. And that's, I think, in the next option. And so you can see that they both fit on the site uh, with some additional parking uh, available. And so, then our consulting group took it one step further. This is just a freehand sketch, um, but to show that, that you can see where the, the senior center building has been slid around a little bit. And both buildings could be, uh, could fit on this site with plenty of parking. I don't know how many spaces that is exactly, but it's more than enough to accommodate all of those needs. Um, and, it, and it, again, it fits right in with the rest of the plan uh, if we were to choose this option. Um, so again, pros and cons. Our, our land is available. We don't have any, any additional cost uh, as far as land goes. Um, potential for a third party operator, we're gonna get into that a little bit later again, as I mentioned, but if, if uh, a senior center is, is built as a wellness center like is done in Oklahoma City, um, probably, well, I don't know, it's possible that we would consider a, uh, a third party operator rather than increasing the size of our staff that it would take to run it um, and, and operate it every day. So, uh, <clears throat> but a third party operator could run that as, and, and probably, as you know, we, we would have a third party operator on, in the pool and, and in the gym. We've been talking about the YMCA as a, as a potential uh, operating partner, for example. Um, and so those arrangements could could happen here um, and uh, are certainly viable there. Um, uh, phased construction that I talked before, if we wanted to add on, probably wouldn't be needed here for the senior center because we would have the pool and the gym already next door. It could, could be co-used. Uh, wouldn't have a reason to duplicate those services necessarily. Um, so, uh, uh, and then lower site development costs, same as, as at uh, Reeves Park. Uh, we don't have the, um, the, the drainage issues and some of those other issues that occur at some of the other sites. Um, on the negative side, uh, 
it's not centrally located uh, geographically in town. And um, uh, although the you know the access is not too difficult off of I-35, but but it isn't part of the Central Norman. Um, and then um, if we were to get into a third-party operator like Oklahoma City has done, um, then that's going to probably include uh, uh, pay for use or uh, fees, use fees, user fees. I'm trying to say or membership costs. Um, and so, which is how they've done that in Oklahoma City. But so those could be certainly could be considered negative uh, components. Okay, option three, Andrews Park, you've seen this before. Um, this is overlaid onto the uh, Andrews Park drawing that, that reflects the uh, uh, intersection, the James Garner intersection that's now uh, in place. And um, this is, as I said earlier, a 21,000 square foot footprint with 111 spaces, uh, parking spaces. Um, I've already mentioned some of the issues with Andrews Park, um, but again, the, the positive side is we own the land. Um, it's centrally located and it's near the new central library. Um, on the negative side, um, it takes away from the open space and the park land. I think there would be some pushback uh, from the community on that. Uh, if we were to take up more space uh, for this facility, for any facility for that matter. Um, development costs are higher. I talked about almost a million dollars in floodplain issues. The Lomer uh, is, I'm understanding, about nine to 12 months time to get through that process. Uh, so that's another potential delay. Um, and um, it's not likely that if we ever wanted to that that we would be able to expand it. I mean, certainly there's room, but again, it's it's taking up more park space, and I think that would come uh, with some resistance. Um, okay, <clears throat> option four. Council oh. Member Hickman. Uh, I, I do think um, we ought to consider, I'll just say, if we're gonna put on Andrews Park that a con is loss of parkland, we should also put that on Ruby Grand as a con. I, I just noticed that that's it seems to be inconsistent. I, that maybe there's a reason why, but well, just, they are both. That's that's fine. That's fair. Um, certainly, the the land at Ruby Grant is there's a lot more land there to lose, but uh, the land that that would accommodate the buildings is not programmed for any use other than just open space, just wild open space. And you may speak to Judd about some of the discussion early on in the Ruby Grant plans long, long time ago about potential for aquatics facilities or other facilities on that land that were yeah, our, conceptually our, thought about. Our master early plan on. that we did uh, back in 09 when it talked about Ruby Grant, it, it identified it as a potential site for uh, potentially a rec center and, or, and possibly a swimming pool. Just, and I'm just curious, on the Ruby Grant side, um, <clears throat> don't know how much traffic it would increase but i don't so i don't know if sean that's something that we've gone to the point where we've considered if we if we because it looks like those projects would all be accessing right over 36th street which i know is going to be part of the bond improvement of that street but i know just also that looks like that senior center at least in the schematic would abut right up against all saints school so there is a, a school right there as well um you know with elementary age kids. So I'm just curious, what, what, do we think a traffic light might be required there? It's still possible. We haven't, obviously that's not been in the plan for 36 Avenue design. It's on the other side. Yeah, it's on the side. end up with a, a large intersection signalization and so on, which would have to be factored so in the 36 Avenue project or uh, this project or project. No, I'm looking at Andrews Park. Judd, is this on the <laughs> north side of River Grant or south side? <laughs> Southwest corner. Southwest just just north of All Saints School. Okay. Okay. Well, here it looks like it's. Um, well, it's off the map. All Saints School is just south of the, just out of the picture on the left hand. See the pond there, LPOG, whatever. The building, the school is just south of that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. So. We're to option four, which is the old L4 site. You remember talking about this too. Um, this is the central library site, which is the building on the far right, the kind of the salmon color or pink color, whatever that is. 
Um, and we, there were four options that we looked at some time ago, uh, west of the central library. Um, council talked about all of those kind of, uh, bounced around between option B, C mm -hmm. and D, uh, ruled out option A. So B, C and D are, are shown here in your packet. They're, they're very similar. Uh, the differences primarily are the amount of parking to the west of the building. And that is important because the more, the more space that is taken by parking uh, means more of the existing residential structures have to be purchased and, and taken down. Um, so various uh, ideas of uh, size and shape of the building, but or the size of the building is about the same, but the size of the parking area around it varies from one option to the next. And um, um, so, pros and cons there, um, you know, obviously a, an important thing and positive thing will be its, its proximity to the central library and its central location in Norman uh, in general. Um, <clears throat> it would be more costly, obviously, to um, um, try to develop this site because of the acquisition of the existing multifamily and single family homes that are there and demolition of those and um, uh, so that land cost would increase um, and uh, <clears throat> would be very difficult if, if not impossible to ever expand that building if we ever wanted to um, it, there would be just simply nowhere to make it any larger <clears throat> um, the last option is the one we've been talking about most recently uh, this is at the north base property um, up next to the YMCA, um, the area shaded in yellow there <clears throat> is, represents about 14 acres, which is what we had been talking to the university about, um, either leasing or purchasing. Uh, that's about what we would need to accommodate all three, the pool, the gymnasium, and the uh, senior center and parking would, would have to take that much space. Um, you're, I know you're all familiar with that, and and um, the pros and cons of that. Obviously, the location is good; it's centrally located. Um, it wouldn't be necessary, same as the, one of the other choices mm -hmm. to, for phase mm -hmm. right? Because it would, it would be adjacent to the other, the pool and the gym facilities already. Um, the land cost will be much higher, probably, if we were to buy it outright. Um, my understanding is we're somewhere between maybe two and three million dollars to purchase that site. Probably a good range. <laughs> and um, or if we were to lease it, uh, we can't lease it for a dollar a year uh, like we had hoped. Uh, so we're looking at a fair market value lease price. Um, <clears throat> our budget doesn't accom accommodate either one of those options really. And um, the <clears throat> excuse me, the existing uh, Optimus Gym. Um, will have to be uh, demolished, and we think that's going to be pretty expensive to take down. We've not been able to get access into it to determine if it has asbestos. We, we suspect it does just because of the age of the building, but we don't know that. And, and so there's a lot of unknowns in terms that, that relate to um, what the cost would be to take it down. Also, in Norman Florida, we programmed... Um, road improvements in that area. The roads in that area um, are, are below average at best. <laughs> and to put all these facilities there, uh, we programmed almost $1.7 million in Norman Forward money to upgrade those road facilities in that area. Um, obviously, if we don't choose this site, that's money we don't have to spend on those roads and we, it would be available for um, something else. <coughs> Um, now, real Council quick. Council Member Hitman has a question. Judge, I mean, in fairness, as to that last slide there on the cons, <clears throat> I mean, we're in, this is in the context of talking about the senior center. But I mean, maybe right. you're maybe you're referring to all the number four projects. If, regardless of whether we do the senior center in the North Base property, or if we do, I guess, any of the Norman Ford projects, we're going to have to demolish the multi the uh, Optimus right. Gym. I mean, that was planned for the even for just the indoor sports facility, the indoor aquatic center. Um, so it's not technically, a, I would say, a con to the senior center location being there because that's going to happen, have to happen, 
unless we just don't put <coughs> any of our Norman Ford projects there, right? Right. right. And the road improvements are funded in Norman Ford, right? That have to be done. In our program. But I, from what uh, Sean said, I assume that if we have to do road improvements on 36th Street for Ruby Grant, <coughs> those are not currently programmed and funded. <coughs> There's the bond issue. Well, not to put a traffic signal in to turn into Ruby Grant Park, it sounds like. Right. And that wasn't in the original project. Was it? I mean, I, you know, traffic signal is perfect. I thought it But that would be some money we could potentially Signals. use. No, no, I understand. I mean, traffic signal is a million bucks or something, I think. Intersection <coughs> with signal, left turn lanes, all that would probably be. Yeah, your point is well taken. I think that we wouldn't. I don't think anybody was thinking if we didn't put the other projects up there that we'd want to put the senior citizen center up there, but maybe somebody did. So if we were putting it up there, then it would be with the thought of putting everything up there and you would have to do all those things if we're going to put everything up there. I mean, that's the way I interpreted it. Council Member Castle. I don't know if this is a pro or not, <clears throat> but if you <clears throat> don't put anything on the North Base property, then you're not tearing down the Optimus Gym. Right. I don't know if that's a pro or not, but if you're having tournaments, it you would give you, it would give you another venue to play. So you might be able to host larger tournaments because you'd have multiple places. Like right now, you have the Optimus, you do it, you use nothing. This would give you, we could have maybe larger regional tournaments, whether it be volleyball or basketball, because we would have yeah, multiple mostly. facilities. Not sure. that Optimus Gym is really a facility that we <laughs> wanted right. over it's showcase, but you know, overflow facility. Yeah. Yeah. I guess a, a way to look at it too is if, if we don't do any of the projects up there, then we also don't have to spend any of the money on the road improvements. Right, right. and so we have that, that money. money. Can go somewhere else. Right, that money can go somewhere else. That was okay. Um, as far as the the wellness center model. Um, we, don't, we put this in here. Really, this probably is a discussion for another day. Um, whenever we get into planning that facility, the senior facility, and what type of facility it needs to be. The reason we put it in this presentation is just to touch base on um, <clears throat> the idea of, of a, a wellness center versus um, something we had contemplated before might make a difference in, in your site selection. Uh, you know, looking at the L4 site, for example. A wellness center probably isn't going to fit there. It just isn't big enough. Um, it would be, I think, it would be difficult to do that also at Andrews Park. And so, if that's what we're thinking about doing, and it may or may not be, but if it is, um, that probably needs to be part of the equation in terms of site selection. Um, and, and I've already mentioned some of the some of the other things that probably don't need to go through all this. But the, you know, it's a third party operator and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So. Um, or, or would be. It is in Oklahoma City, at least. And um, uh, so, Council Member to just Wilson. toss that in just for Wilson has a question. Um, what kind of membership do you like? Is that, I mean, how much is that generally and for I'll, those kinds of places? And I'll point out to um, our, our uh, program manager for firm from ADG also works for works on the MAPS program and, and they provide us some information. But I believe in Oklahoma City, it ranges as a sliding scale between forty and fifty dollars a month for a member. <coughs> on, the, on that scale, is what I understand. I like the idea of the wellness centers. Uh, I don't know that I fully understand what the that looks like, but I don't. I really would like to stay away from forty or fifty dollar a month fee. Yeah, for a public facility, the public paid the bill. And we just wanted to bring forward to you the model they use in Oklahoma City since there's been a lot of discussion about that. Here's kind of what, what they're using to right. sustain. Yeah, you know, yeah. To yeah I understand that. that. <laughs> okay, Council Member Hickman, then Castleberry. Uh, <clears throat> looking at these options, I think one thing that hopefully we are being thoughtful about is forward thinking and you know, and the possibility for expansion uh, options or add-ons or um, other related facilities, I'll, I'll say. And so with that consideration, you know, I, I'm just cautious, I'll say, to you to use any of the parkland sites. Some of them, I think you're right, Judd, there just really isn't an expansion option. And, um, you know, and even with what we would be doing in Ruby Grant, you know, the idea of expanding and taking up more of that land 
I, I'm just cautious, you know, to go that route. Um, you know, you know, I one of the things that I've been talking to some some conversations I've had with some of the stakeholders. I just kind of want to propose this idea, and I've said it to some of the council members that I think um, we could take the transportation bond and take two to three million dollars out of that. And knowing that we think that we're likely going to get something worked out, the Department of Mental Health, based on their action they took recently as, a, as their board, <clears throat> that might free up some money for the construction costs for the senior center. But if we took two or three million dollars out of the transportation bond and had a standalone levelized tax, so it's no tax increase, uh, and put that as a separate ballot measure on our April agenda with the other bonds, those dollars could be used to purchase that North Base land for all three of those sites, because that's one of the comments that I've heard from many people in the community is the city needs to take control of its own destiny and, and not have to rely upon partners that we could buy that land from the university for fair market value. And that could be the site for the Indoor Aquatic Center, the multi-sports facility, the senior center. Um, you know, and if we bought it for, like I said, their, whatever the price value or it's no more than that, uh, with some kind of a deadline with OU that we want some kind of a written agreement approved, you know, as soon as possible, uh, ideally by their uh, January uh, Regents meeting so that we would know when we voted, you know, near the time we'd have to be voting on the bond, uh, we'd have some degree of assurance it was on the agenda, I think by then, um, that we then could vote on that bond to send, you know, it to the April ballot and we would certainly know by April by the time people went to vote on it that OU has signed a, a you know real estate purchase agreement subject to you know bond funding um, and then if that ballot measure gets approved you know we have that real estate contract we, we close on the land purchase we own the dirt and I think we've already started the process of, of sending out um, RFPs or whatever we were for the site design for the three sites and we just dust that off and get our ad hoc committees together and um, now everything is within our control. We have the money, you know, for the Norman in the Norman Ford projects to build those three sites. We should uh, to build the roads, and you know, we're no longer having to say to people we're waiting on, you know, whatever other state agency. But I think that doing that bond to allow us to buy the land doesn't put undue strain on the rest of Norman Ford, and try to make the money we might free up from the Department of Mental Health have to cover. You know acquisition costs for other other things um you know or you know stretch it to where we don't have the money that we need to build, <clears throat> to build the senior center and i and i've had a brief conversation with with sean and uh, i know that i'd previously proposed like about a 10 million dollar bond for the senior center but now that we have some better assurances that the department of Mental health bill looks like it's going to happen we could scale that idea down to just a land acquisition cost um to then that takes care of the the prices project, the indoor sports facility, and you know the senior center, and we don't have to infringe upon any of our uh, parks. Yeah, and, I, and I'll make the comment again in in considering that is a that's definitely an option. In considering that as an option, we've got to consider the time constraint that we have. It has to go. We have to decide what's going to be on the ballot by January. You're, First and second reading has to be in January for an April ballot. So if if we don't have the land, I mean, I would be uncomfortable putting something on the ballot if we don't have the land secured. That's the Norman Ford on the ballot without the land secured. And that's kind of how we're in this predicament. Well, and, and that's what everybody's upset about right now. I guess the point is that the um, to, to, for an April bond election, it looks like the, the second reading is the 22nd. That's when our meeting is, but the notice deadline to the election board is the 31st. You know, my understanding of how OU Regents boards typically work is they're going to know some period of time before that January 27th uh, when the Regents meet if it's going to be on the agenda. And, uh, you know, I think history tells us that if it's on the agenda, it's likely going to pass. But, you know, we don't have to do that idea. I'm just trying to come up with a proposal that solves the problem and acquires the land. And we don't have to then have to worry about you know a recurring lease cost let's say to owe you if we go to the north bay site or push back from the parks folks about infringing upon park space because even the reeves park site that is probably my next favorite site um i'm just not sure that there would be space there to build an actual wellness type center based on that 
the design looked more like a traditional senior center, but certainly not sure if there'd be space there to do any add-ons in the future. If we got the OU land, I mean, we'd have ample, I think, extra space, you know, to potentially add on other supplemental facilities to the, to the senior center, to add on to the senior center. You know, um, I, I think that it gives us more flexibility um, in what we could do up there if we were able to secure that land. I think what Judd was explaining to us when he showed the Reeves model is that there is expansion space there. Just, just so, and we do already own that. It's already ours. So, in considering the other <coughs> option. <coughs> yes, Council Member Castleberry. Uh, two, two comments. The first one is I agree with, with Council Member Wilson. Member Wilson, it's too late. It's cool. <laughs> uh, Lady. When we talked about uh, <laughs> Norma Forward, a couple of years, you know, when we first did it, one of the things we talked about was, it was in relation to Westwood, was these are going to be, the public is going to pay for this. It's going to be public funding, and therefore there needs to be low cost of membership or admission, stuff like that. And I think that was kind of a general agreement that hey since taxpayers are funding these facilities it needs to be at either a discount to a normal citizen your id card or something and so i think that if we're, if we're going to do the wellness center or any type of membership like that there needs to be some type of either low cost structure or a discount for a norman resident and i understand that almost <clears throat> forward is a sales tax deal and non-residents come in here all the time and they pay sales tax and that Norman people spend sales tax in Oklahoma City, but in general, the majority of our sales tax of our citizens in Norman are spent in Norman on this facility. So there should be some type of you know discount for that. Second thing would be I, I like to, to explore Councilman Hickman's idea a little further. Um, I, I do think that the having all three of those facilities together in a centrally located area makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of synergy there. Um, whether we do it through a bond issue, whether we do it through the, the TIF, whether we do it out of Norman Forward, whether we do it out of the capital fund, I mean, coming up with two to $3 million, you know, I'd like to explore the, the what our possible, you know, our options are on that. Um, I mean, we could, if we put it in their bond issue that we're gonna spend $3 million to acquire land, it doesn't mean we have to do it. I mean, if we decide to put stuff on the park, but you doesn't approve it, you're right. We but could, if they don't approve it, then we don't have we don't issue the bonds. So we've got a, 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 a voter approved uh, issue to build a senior center and land right now that we're not doing. You know, so That's true. good point. Yeah, it gives us the the option to do that. Doesn't necessarily mean we have to do it. Um, so I'd like to maybe explore that. Have staff maybe look at that a little further to see what all our financing options. I know we're going to short deadline, but you know, one thing we also talked about is in our transportation bond issues, and, and, and Norman hasn't done this in the past, but I think the bond council said that we only really have to identify 70% of our projects of what we're going to do. Is that, am I remembering that right? Now, we normally identify 100% of what our projects are going to be, and I'm a little, to use uh, your term, cautious about saying, Here's 10% of this $60 million bond. Here's $6 million. We don't really know what we're going to do with it, <laughs> you know, but it may go for this project, may go for land acquisition, you know, but if, if we need to do something like that and have a contingency for that, I mean, I, I would be open to that. We need to make that some tight language so it's not a well, slush fund and we, you know, maybe pass a resolution as our intent to use it for this type of stuff. And uh, so there's people know what they're voting on. I, I like the fact that we do identify all our projects. Um, I think that helps give us a little bit more credibility with, with the public. Now we got to follow through with that. But I, I like the idea of, I really like the idea of all three of those being centrally located. Uh, I think it might help us in the future if we ever start doing some car stuff expansion on there. We've got two, two million dollars, whatever, for road improvements. We had kind of, in the, when, we, when we did those, we identified that area. So those costs are kind of based on that area. Uh, coming through there, so. Um. Council Member Hickman. No, and uh, I, I agree with you, Robert, and, and that's a good point that we don't actually have to issue the bond if things do end up falling through with OU. I just think it's important that people understand that, I mean, this this is not anybody's fault that we're in this position, but that's why I asked Anthony, and I think Terry drew the blunt of my questioning, 
uh, last week was that there just wasn't acquisition dollars, you know, in the budget for Norman Ford to buy the dirt for these Norman Ford projects. And I know I hear from seniors as well as the Pisces project folks that in the aquatic people a lot. In fact, they were in front of council quite a bit last week. And based on my conversations in particular with, you know, representatives of the Pisces project, and I suspect Norman Ford people in the community in general, you know, they understand that we're not asking for money that we didn't already have that we that we already had. They understand we have this problem. It's nobody's fault, you know. And you know, I'm highly confident based on those conversations that they would send up the flare, you know, as I refer to it, or make the call to their supporters to go vote, you know, for this bond. You know, we need this money to buy this land. I think people in our community understand there's value in us owning that dirt uh, that we're going to build these projects on. Uh, and it allows us to not have to build in existing parks. So I think it would be something, if we're talking about a Vision Norman bond package we're putting out in April, that is going to have a positive tone to it to support transportation and stormwater. You have the opportunity to also bring out another group of voters, you know, that are going to see us solving, you know, what is considered, I think, in the community, a significant community problem in that we have Norman Ford projects on hold because we don't have the land secured. They're going to come and vote yes for $3 million, $2 million to buy dirt to solve their problem. And they're going to say, good job, city. Yes on transportation. Yes on stormwater. That's my theory. And I think it's a lot, you know, I think it's, there's some credence to that. And so I, I would even say that adding this land acquisition bond onto that ballot, as we've talked about, you know, doing stormwater and transportation together and our Han consultants have said to us, actually further enhances the vision concept of, you know, we're solving problems, we're investing in Norman, you know, and I think that our Norman Ford, you know, uh, community, you know, citizen community folks would get behind ensuring people to get out and vote to support that that three million dollar bond, you know, to buy that land to solve these problems. Because I think it's pretty well known in the community that we're Norman Ford's, you know, we're kind of tight on money and that we may not be able to scrape this money together just in the city's budget or within Norman Ford and and three million dollars, I think, from what Sean has, has said, but I'll let him talk. You know, it's not going to break the budget or, or significantly hurt transportation bond. Council member, uh, Holman. I want to ask you a question. Uh, please go ahead. I just I wanted to ask. So, how are you? What's the interplay on that in your proposal for the ten million dollars for the funding of the building? Is this? Well, I think the senior center. I think that idea wouldn't be necessary because of the the mental health deal. If, okay. if we feel comfortable with that, honestly. We okay, we'd use yeah. that for the. And I think we would know that also by the end of this year. So we think. Okay, thank you. I mean, that, that's my thought would be, Robert, that uh, okay. if, if we freed up that seven, eight million dollars because we get the departmental health lease done, that's your construction costs, I'm thinking, for the I senior center. Seven million, we talked about 10 million. I know we don't really have a good number. We're just throwing. Yeah, money. and if we had to pull together an extra million or so for the construction costs as we go through that process, I think that's manageable from a city, you know, capital fund project. I think we can scrape that money together. You're talking about 20,000 square foot facility at $300 a foot. That's six million bucks. I think we're we're in that range. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we should be able to get something. Depending on any kind of land yeah. issue, environmental issues, yeah, that kind of thing. Sure. Councilmember Holman. So, based on all these discussions, I do I do think that the North Base option is the best one. I do like the idea of the three being the three facilities being together, um, and the synergy that could be created by them and the ability of senior citizens to use the indoor aquatic facility and the uh, gymnasium if they would like. Um, it would put the senior center, in my vision anyway, would be on the corner of Lexington and Flood. So it'd be a prominent building as people come into Norman uh, that people would see, which would be good for us, I think. Um, I mean, again, ideally, I would like the senior center to be right down here. I just, and I've been supportive of the Andrews Park option for a long time it just the more and more it kind of gets more and more heartburn about it as we keep considering it based on the cost and floodplain and the park space and it is a really small park um i think the only other option for the indoor aquatic center in the gymnasium is ruby grant park i don't think there is anywhere else in norman we could put those two if we can't do it on the north base but I also don't like the idea of the senior center being at Ruby Grant Park and being on the very far side of town like that. Uh, maybe I think it, it would make sense 
in the future when Norman maybe has two or three senior wellness centers that Ruby Grant Park have one of them and there'd be a central one and there'd be an east side one. Um, you know, and with Reeves Park, um, it's centrally located in a sense, but it is kind of more on the south end of, of Norman and there's not any other facilities around it, that, you know, as far as a pool or a gymnasium or anything. You know, I think senior citizens having access and use to Reeves Park would be beneficial and being close to campus and everything would be nice. And it is a nice area to be in for sure. Um, so I'd want to, you know, keep that one on the table, of course, but, uh, you know, I, I do think the best option is that North Base option. If we can do it through the way, I mean, I would support exactly what you proposed, um, you know, doing a bond that's just for the purchase of that land. Then we own the land. We don't have to talk about leases and OU and anything ever again. And so I do think that's the best option that I would like to pursue currently. And it might help us build better relations with OU if we write them a two or three million dollar check, right? Sure. <laughs> They're looking for money. Okay, so the the I'm hearing people say that they want to have the staff continue to talk to OU about about the issue of buying. Does it make a difference if they come back and say we can't consider it in January? We're not considering it to till March. I mean I mean, for me personally, I mean, I, I hadn't thought about it until council member uh, Casper made the comment. It's like the 2008 bond. I mean, I guess the risk, I mean, I'm open to still consider it. I guess to answer the quick question, uh, I think the only risk then just to identify the risk is that we would be potentially losing two, two, two point whatever million dollars in transportation bond if we end up deciding if OU ends up not, I mean, I think we, it has to be, we have to, I think we have to have something signed from OU by the election in April. That to me is the drop dead. If they aren't with two regents meetings in January and then one in March, if they aren't willing to sign, you know, I'll say a real estate contract or something committing to selling it to us, then I think that you're right, Mayor, that we shouldn't put it on the ballot for the people to vote on, uh, or we should make it, you know, even if we are, I guess it may already be on the ballot, but it, it can be clear to people that, you know, we're not going to uh, be able to issue that bond because we didn't get it approved. Now, if it's possible, if they approve it afterwards and there's, you know, it's in May, then it's, you know, it does get approved. I think we have just to evaluate that. But I guess the point is, like Robert said, if they don't end up approving, we don't have to issue it. We, we, we won't know. We might put something on the ballot that we can't do, but we can help I, people. I'd like to ask Brenda a question first, and then I'll come back to you, Joe. Um, if, if we choose to put something on the ballot, I'm hearing people say we're going to let people vote and then say, well, we're not going to let the bonds because... We didn't. We didn't get the deal with OU. I mean, and that does that put us back in the same place we were with the library, where we had people vote on the bonds, and then we. Well, I, th I thought that it was being proposed that the bond would have language that said the senior center could be built as a standalone entity. Blah 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 blah. And it didn't have to be assigned to a location. If you, if you don't make it site specific, so that if you know. that deal fell through, you have you so have your money the, for the, your senior center. Else. But the purpose is for the two million dollars is to buy all the land for all the projects. We can't put it on a, a bond issue and say this is two million dollars for the senior citizen center. We're talking about acquisition of land for three Norman forward projects. So you have to think about how, how are you, what, what do you call that? How do you explain it? How do you talk about it? How do you educate people about it? Council member Holman. I mean, I definitely want to continue exploring these options. I mean, part of me feels like we've been dealing with this so long that, I, you know, the, the quickest, an easiest option, in my opinion, is Reeves Park. So we don't have to buy any land. There's no FEMA issue. There's room for expansion, all those things. And uh, so part of me is thinking, let's just make a decision and do that, you know, and not have to wait for OU or a two to $3 million land bond that voters may or may not approve. Or <coughs> they might not use if they do approve it. I mean, I do really like the idea. I think it's worth continuing to explore that. But again, I just want to state part of me is kind of like, 
three years of this discussion, I don't <laughs> waiting even a few more months to figure this out when again, not my first choice, but Reeves Park, I think, is our easiest and quickest option to get a facility yes, I would done. I agree with that. Councilmember Carter. <laughs> so if, if, if option five were to be pursued, five. not five, five is north four, north. four, four, is there a funding mechanism to do that? <laughs> It would have to be the ten million that. Well, it could be just the land acquisition costs. Right. We still have to come up with the money somewhere. My well, you'd, you'd have about eight million dollars to work with from the. <clears throat> and you'd have no room for expansion That's, if you wanted to do that. My heartburn about the, I mean, in my opinion, option four is the best location for a senior center to be yeah. right next to the library, without a doubt. My heartburn about it is the displacing the apartment complex and you know four or five houses to make way for the parking lot and that there's no room for any future expansion there either that's kind of where i get the because we already because, bought a few houses for yeah, the library and that's like but you want you want to finish so, and then i'll question. let councilman so wilson is the you. purpose of what we're do you need direction today of what well we're just you, we're just are we supposed to we, we, we don't we don't have to make a decision today because we I don't think we can make a decision today because we've asked staff to go back and talk to talk to OU to see whether or not that will work out. Then we're going to have to come back together again, I think, and say that works. That didn't work. We do want to put it on the ballot. We don't want to put it on the ballot. If that doesn't work, what's our second? What's our second choice? Yeah, there's so many moving pieces here that it's. <laughs> this is what it's been like since we started talking. I, I, I don't. I don't think there's any expectation yeah. that we're okay. reaching That's a what conclusion I was wondering. tonight. We. I, I would ask one question. Okay. Are there any we can eliminate? Ruby Grant, in my part, in my opinion. Oh, oh, no. I, I'm not. I don't want to eliminate it. Okay. Still not having an opinion. Well, so and, no. And I would, okay. I would, I would point well, out to council if you look at the options, some of them when we consider the Reeves Park Senior Center, that that conceives Reeves Park for a senior center, and then the indoor aquatics facility at Ruby Grant. <laughs> right. So those two facilities, the indoor facilities would stay at Ruby Grant, while Reeves would contain the senior center. So they That's don't the, necessarily to have to be. So one, right. one, so one was there an deal. option? Then? That is the quickest option. That's the one we can we can start contracting and planning and all that if we did that. So was there an option? Okay, I am confused now. Um, I can't read that though. I don't have my big glasses on. Um, but so was there? It's up on the screen. It's up on the screen. Oh, oh God. Okay, hold on. Let me read all of it. Let me just ask the question. Is there an option with the aquatic center, multi sport facility, and the senior center at the Reeves Park location? No. no, no. That would what about if? So the option is Ruby Grant and Reeves Park. We can think about it in terms of the three facilities together would roughly take about 14 acres. So we have to think about what's the availability of 14 acres in our options. And there's if really we're two options together, where we yeah. can put together 14 acres that doesn't just completely impact something totally negatively. And those are the North Base option or Ruby Grant. Those are the two options for a, a, a facility that would have all three facilities. Other than that, the facilities and the different options can see the senior center being in one place, but still having enough land, which will still require about 11 to 12 acres to still build the indoor facility. So the two options for the aquatics facilities and multiple sport facilities are really those two, North Basin mm -hmm. and Ruby mm -hmm. Grant of what we've decided at this point, given all the different ideas. The senior center is a little, little more flexible in its options. It can move in different places, hence the, <laughs> the crazy think, matrix here. I think uh, Judd things. has also been talking with the different stakeholders from the different groups. I did. I, I, in fact, recent, just as recent as this morning, we talked with uh, uh, Joe Pasley at the Y, the director at the YMCA, and um, just to see if they were still interested in being at the table. And they certainly are, regardless of the location. Um, whether they're next door to the Y or at Ruby Grant or Reeves Park or any combination, uh, they want to be uh, 
at the table to talk about mm -hmm. being an operating partner. The yeah, yeah. member card. So since now option five requires purchasing land, spending money. So four and five are, are buying land. Since we're in the buying land business now, don't we have two acres out at UTC already as part of that clawback and all of that agreement? There's and is that land there? If there's another 10 acres, is that a, I mean, I'm throwing out of option six, you know, but is that at least, is that a, I mean, if that lands a million dollars, is there enough land out there? Yeah, under well, they were going to give us 16 acres, five, right, for something. Under development agreement number five, there was uh, uh, two acres that were donated to the cultural facility, but there was also, hey, also an option to buy, to buy additional acreage <laughs> at, uh, five, I think it's $5 or five fifty dollars a square foot. And uh, probably that space, which is just north of Embassy Suites, uh, would, would be at least 14 acres. Two would be free. We'd have to buy twelve. That was in my mind. It was sixteen total acres. Huh? Pretty nice. I don't think it's more like nineteen, but we can look at that. Mm -hmm. But I know it will be at least fourteen. Council member, yeah. Council Berry. Council Lady, Council Berry. So another option out there, as far as from a financing standpoint, <clears throat> we'll take three million dollars off of the lifestyle set or the cultural cultural facility cultural facility reduce that budget by three million dollars and have the tip pay for it <laughs> gee <laughs> i wonder where that idea came from. all right well hey let's say so that's only raised three million dollars out of there okay, okay so you had a project by three million dollars <laughs> that extends the tip by six months by the time we decide what we want to do we will we'll already have the money and if you want to eliminate the lifestyle center Eliminate the lifestyle center and add three add a new project for million dollars. If you're that concerned about that stuff, we can we can make this so that there will never be an arena no matter what we do. We can, we can get rid of that option, okay? But I'm just saying we've got a fun mechanism in place. And if we can make we talked about taking those two projects off the table, take them off the table, add another project. I mean, this council unanimously voted to add a senior center as a project. So not add a project. No, not add a project. <coughs> Use reallocate. the cultural facility Re funds as a senior center. Okay, reallocate it. Replace it. Replace and that's it. what he's saying. I'm talking about replace it and reduce Define it. Find the cultural center <laughs> as the senior center. That's what I'm having a groundhog day not, moment. It was, it was a defined. Culture is not defined. But you're still talking about doing the and same it, thing. You're still talking about an amount of money out of the TIF that was allocated for one thing to allocate it for something else. That's no, exactly what you're talking about. I'm just Respectfully, Mayor, the cultural potential. center is not defined. There is not anything that says this is what a cultural center is. It could be an aquarium. It could be a museum for, for um, gymnastics. We just said the cultural center, we that we all voted for, just to remind everybody, we said that the cultural center is a senior and cultural center You know that could be funded. So. And I mean, my point was, at that point in time, we kind of agreed that we want to reallocate that money, reallocate, use it for something different, whether it's a senior center. Let's take that out. I don't really care how we get there. The idea is to use $3 million of TIF funds to do this, and we don't have to do it. That leaves $3 million that we can keep in transportation issues for other projects or in Norman Forward. So I think it's just another financing option we got to consider. If there's no money, just go to the general fund otherwise. Yeah. So ending Not the, true. Ending the Not tip true. kind of does the same thing, <laughs> right? What? Ending the tip does the same thing. The money goes over. Ending the tip by removing the projects from the project plan and defunding it or whatever you want to call that. Then the money that is sitting there, there is money sitting there. Am I correct? For project. For cost. projects, but we're going to eliminate those projects. Only two. Are you talking about eliminate all the projects? We eliminate the two big projects. How much money, Anthony? Is it? The is amount of money, money that you have on hand is still the same. Yeah. How much it's money just, do we have on hand? About eleven million dollars. Okay, so there's eleven million dollars, and we end the TIF 
how much money ends up in our general fund that's not allocated for something like the Robinson Crossroads. We collect the same taxes. Okay. I think what you're trying to get to his question. Oh, question. Of the funds that are currently on deposit, which is about $11 million, you have obligated about a million for to the Robinson West project, mm -hmm. about $75,000 to the bid. Mm -hmm. um, and potentially some other obligations for economic development. So you could say that there's something five to six million dollars available for re reversion to the general fund and capital fund and to the property tax and jurisdictions. Three of which that need to go to fill the budget hole. One quick question. So does that number go from 11 to 13 on December 31st when the property taxes get apportioned? Uh, yes. Yes. So we got 13 in a month. Assuming that that $2 million is from this career. But, okay, so. So, so my way in, ends the TIF and closes that door. Your way leaves the TIF open. Well, okay. Extends the TIF. Fine in the TIF, but all that money would just go into the general fund. And so if you want to make a resolution to say of the money coming from the UNP TIF to the general fund, we're going to take $3 million and set it aside for that land, that, that accomplishes the same thing. It's the same dollars either way. We can, I, I just. It actually accomplishes more because it ends the TIF at the same time that it finds the funds for land acquisition. It, if that's your goal. Which all has to go through the statutory review committee. Right. And, they're not and they've already said that the a cultural center can't be a senior center. Right. Well, it passed the right. I'm a little so confused. We, we talked about we there's $25 million dollars of projects left to do in the TIF. And we're going to take six, if, we, if, you, million if you eliminate the other 16 million out, that gets us a 12 million. Right? Um, I think that come out to be about nine. Yeah. Okay. Previously, you told us that all the money that's in the TIF has already been allocated, and now you're coming up telling me there's four or five million dollars that we, do, we 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 don't have for I mean that we could use for projects. I'm not sure why. If you're defining allocated, I, I assign the project. We had project cost. Yeah, we have authorized projects remaining of about twenty five million dollars. We have about eleven million dollars to pay for those authorized projects. If you don't change any of the project mix and you end the tax apportionments now, okay, then then I got about two million excess. Yes. You know, it's different than five million. <laughs> Which you said just a little bit ago. But well, anyway, but I just said to remove the projects. Right. The money right. But that, that's my point. Me. I think that's another financing option, whether we if we if we if we end the TIF, if that's the direction we go. But I think in order to maybe gives the, the seniors some clarity, we're going to reserve that money for the land purchase at the North Base. And so I, I you know. I, Isn't that I, what I, we I, said in the beginning? Isn't have, that, didn't we come in here and say, hey, we got so much crap for it from you saying, hey, I think we have money sitting in this TIF that's not being used. It's called a cultural center that nobody has defined. And then we said, hey, how about we try to use that for a senior center? Because the project play is a genius idea. And then it... It doesn't meet the definition of a senior center. <sighs> what are you saying then? Who's got the definition? Who's got the money? Okay, who's got the definition? Definition? No one's got the definition. I'm not using that money. But that's, I'm not taking <laughs> the, the lifestyle money or the culture money and calling it land purchase. I'm, that project's being done away with. It's off the table. So I don't have to worry about the definition of it because it doesn't exist anymore. That's how I'm doing. Oh, that's okay. okay. I don't think we need to keep re no, 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 litigating no, I, I, this yeah, whole and I, thing. Not, and over I wasn't going to go again. there, Mayor. I, I was just going to say, really, to Joe's point about the two acres, um, I, you know, I don't think from the seniors that I've heard that they want us to take that two acres, buy another ten or twelve adjacent to it, right by Industry Suites, and be in the heart of that commercial development. You know. Um, you know, uh, of, of, of the TIF. Uh, and so while I understand where you're coming from, um, I, 
I think the concept of the cultural center and the money for that was to put it in the North Base area because that was within the project plan, but it was not to capitalize on the two acres identified for the cultural center site and the option to buy surrounding acreage. I could be wrong, but all the seniors that I've talked to, you know, did not support the idea of putting the senior center actually in, you know, in that spot there by the, by the MC suite. So it may be that that's not really a viable option. Um, and I think we've litigated, as the mayor said, you know, the cultural center and the TIF funds, and that may or may not be an option, but at the end of the day, um, you know, that doesn't leave us a location uh, unless we get the land deal worked out with OU. And um, we have <laughs> lots of things, lots of issues that we saw earlier on the capital project deal we can, have, we can spend money on. Um, and that's why I think the bond idea solves the funding problem for the Norman Ford sites. Uh, if we are if we're able to get something worked out with the university in a reasonable period of time to know that um, so that, we're going to wait gonna so if we do that then we're talking about waiting till April to make all these final decisions about where things are going to be I mean I, I don't I mean I think we can Maybe get we'll we will know if we use is going to have agreed to the land deal right but we, we have to wait till the Till it passes before we know that we have the money the to buy it. To well, that's true, but at the same time, I mean, I mean, if we end this hit, we're not going to necessarily be able to start breaking project. ground on the indoor aquatic center, the indoor that's sports facility, right or the senior center either. I mean, we're not talking about. <laughs> I would consider a, you know, a delay of any you know, notable consequence. What are, what are we Every talking about, we talk about in terms of starting the ball rolling? We've if, already if, done the. Uh, yeah. For. Be for any and all these projects? No, if if yeah, for all of the pro yeah. for for okay. let's let's talk about the senior citizen center, and then talk about the aquatic center, and then talk about the multi sports center. Depending on where we put them, if we put them somewhere we already have, I'm just saying this is an element of our decision making. Right. What what kind of time would we be looking at? We have a short list of design firms already selected uh, so we could contact them immediately and set up interviews select a design team um, and start if, if the reason we haven't done that is because we don't have a site like, selected yeah. and it wouldn't be um, prudent I don't think to um, have somebody start designing a facility where we don't know what's gonna where it's gonna go so <clears throat> we're ready we're teed up and ready for a design team selection um, and that could that process could start immediately uh, get them selected they I'm guessing it would take um, <clears throat> a year plus or minus depending on for any or all of those facilities to be designed uh, and go through public input processes and so forth and get the construction documents completed <laughs> and then um, start building uh, you know a year depending on the facility um, <clears throat> a year to two years to build it uh, you know, a year and a half, probably plus or minus, to to build any one of those. But but we could start on a lot of these options now, given the work we've already done um, for the for where we were previously with the finalist. Um, we would just ask ask those teams to come in, interview, begin negotiating the contract, bring co contract forward to council, and point ad hoc groups, and as we've done on the other projects, begin the process. Okay. So we're we're. Two and a half, three years away from to from design to construction completion, uh, probably minimum, um, on any of the sites that we own today. Uh, and then, so if you want to wait longer, to whether it's April or whatever, to know if you're going to have a different site, um, then you add that time between now and then to to that <coughs> timeline. Um, that's how long it would take you to get there. So, okay. So the, I think the most urgent project is the senior center. I mean, the aquatic and multi-sport, they can wait four months, five months, and, and probably not be too upset since you're talking about two or three year development cost. If you look at this, and the quickest we could do a senior center would be if we did on Reach Park or Ruby Grant. Correct. Because we could start that tomorrow if you're ready. That's true. So that really only gains us five months if we're talking about April bond issue type of stuff. So that gains us five months in a 
two year process. Three. Let me still three. Well, I'm probably if we just seniors there by itself. Okay. We just nailed that one down there, so okay. it's still not really to me accept, acceptable. I'd like to start tomorrow, but uh, I think we have to take that consideration of unless we can come up with the two and a half million dollars somewhere else and not do the bond issue that we could start. But you still have to have a site to figure out where you're going to do it. So the site selection is really something that we have to, I think, prioritize or figure out which direction we want. It to sounds go. to us like, it sounds to me like, you had two and a half million dollars available for land purchase. I do North Bay. The, yeah. The, since it seems to be North Bay. Yeah. I, I think the only, I think the only difference would be if if we have that the money tied down, that would be the preference for everybody. Um, for all of them together. And then if not, then the only other thing I've really heard is Reeves and Ruby Grant or everything at Ruby Grant. Right. I mean, that would be, that would be the secondary choice if we, we don't think that we can really get that money or if we're not willing to try to get it from the TIF or some other way. And I'm not sure how long it would take to purchase the land from OU. Yeah, that's going to be the other thing is once we, once we, you know, and if we have the demolishing money. That. is that the end of the negotiations? They just agree and they take the money. I mean, before we negotiated for a long time, but maybe it wouldn't be this time. Yes, council member. Russell. I just need to point out that Ruby Grant Park location is a very long ways from a lot of Ward 5. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you think about Ward 5, uh, starting and not just word, but I mean, you know, the east side of town, it, you know, goes all the way to 180th. So, you know, that is a very long ways from a lot of people that would use or could use that facility. So, I would like to see the swim complex be in a more centrally located place. Councilmember Hickman. I mean, look, I've been since I've been a first day on council. <laughs> You know, and going through forums, a big proponent and supporter of the standalone senior center. You know, I don't want to delay getting that done either, but we've got to deal with the cards that we've been dealt. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to high level people at the university, and I feel very confident that if we're willing to now, because the circumstances are different than last negotiation, we're talking about writing them a check for something at or near their appraised value, you know, and, you know, that's what they want is they, you know, they want to be, they want, acquisition dollars you know they want commercially sure, sure. we have the we have the letter from the general counsel that says commercially reasonable terms or whatever and paying appraised value is it doesn't get any more than commercially reasonable and we've they've already sold us land before our fleet maintenance uh offices i think are, are up there so while i've been one to be skeptical skeptical about relying on other third parties in this situation i don't see that there's as much risk on the ou land acquisition part uh, but I am sensitive to the delay in the and the and the seniors on that point, and you know I've always said that I'll in a way defer them. My comment or question, I guess I have really for Judd and you guys is, you know, I would think that we would want to have, as opposed to tomorrow going out and engaging a consulting firm and and moving forward, which surprised me that that was the answer, because frankly I would expect that we would go to the Reeves Park ad hoc committee and the Ruby Grant ad hoc committee and say, hey guys, what do you think about dropping a senior center in the middle of your master plan that we've already approved, I thought as council, and they'd already approved. Now, I mean, may maybe I'm wrong, but I would think that our reaction would be, let's recall those ad hoc committees, let's you know, have a conversation with them, because if we're gonna have these ad hoc committees, then we're just gonna say, oh, by the way, now we're gonna put you know, a 20,000 square foot you know, senior center in the Reeves Park. They may be fine with that, but I think you're kind of disrespecting, but arguably, the process that we've already gone through and the work that we've already approved. And so if we are going to respect that process, because I think process is important in the storm Ford project, then I think it's a little bit unfair to say that tomorrow we could call those people and start doing a design layout. I think we would need to recall those ad hoc committees, you know, you know, you know, whether we do some work to show them what we're talking about or what you've shown us tonight and present that to them, you know, get some feedback from them, they may have things that we don't know about because they were involved in the knee deep aspects of those discussions and those designs and say, 
well, but what are you going to do about this? Or what are you going to do about that? Um, and get that feedback. I mean, I know that I would feel a lot better if we were to do, you know, option one, Reese Park and Ruby Grant, that we were told, okay, this has gone back through because, you know, that's how it was done before. We didn't vote on anything until it had gone through the ad hoc committee process and got their blessing that I would think we would want to go back through that process and then say, and then you guys come back, staff come back to council and say, we've gone back through the ad hoc process. Here's where their recommendations about how we do the siting, et cetera, et cetera. And we relocate whatever might need to be relocated. And then we say, okay, go forward. I would guess that that's, I don't know, a month, two months, considering we're coming into the holiday season. Maybe not, but I don't know if it's actually a five month delay, if you I will. Yeah, no, I'm saying I'm not, I'm not sure. If, I think if you go through the proper, if you go through the process that we have in the past, with the ad hoc committees. So you're just saying you'd like us to call the ad hoc committees back. We can do that. Well, I mean, I think that we should just to keep these options on the table. I mean, because I mean, well, I, right. I, when, when I've talked to a few people in town and they're like, you're all talking about building these things where? When has that been discussed? Huh? You know, I watched we all the ad hoc committee budget. discussions and there was nothing said about this. What's going on? So I think that that's a relatively significant change to the ad hoc committee's work that I think would be worthwhile to recall these ad hoc committees okay. that have already but, approved. But just remember then we're, we're trying to cram more and more stuff in, which we do constantly. We're going to cram more and more stuff in and get something ready for a ballot in April. We're going to have committee meetings. We're going to, I mean, I, I, I'm just, we do have a timeline here. So maybe somebody can figure it out. I don't know. I don't have any problem with putting it on the ballot. I don't have any problem with that. I have a problem with how we can do all these things and. I'm sorry, make, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But no, I, that's fine. I'm I'm just going on. I, I, I was just afraid that I might have misled council into a misunderstanding about Councilman Castleberry's proposal because if the if council wants to do option five at North Base and wanted to use TIF money to buy the land, you could, without extending the TIF, use the use the money that is on hand. Okay, you, there's enough money to do that. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't mis mislead them. But we still have to have the deal with OU. Yeah. Well, I got you. I understood it. I think the option, what I was looking on that is, we don't have to wait for an we, election. Because of the timeline of trying to get something done by January to get the bond issue with this, that, you know, if we can't meet that deadline, we would still have a funding source to, so it wouldn't push us for that January time crunch, is what I was thinking as a possibility. Council member yeah, Coleman. We, <clears throat> so doing that, using the money we have on hand to purchase land at North Base, using TIF money that we have on hand to purchase the land at North Base for these three projects would not negatively impact the West Robinson project. No, there's enough money to this. Is What is the con to us doing that, to using TIF money that's on hand to buy the property at North Base? Because what's the con of that? I mean, there's Whenever a process you approve to be it. gone through that would be a change to the project plan, but as far as financially, there's really no need to con. So change the project plan, meaning Potential supermajority to no. override the statutory well, review. Or? We're currently trying to call together, based on council's last resolution, the statutory review committee right. to talk. So we can just add this to the discussion. If you want. But if the statutory review committee said, "Well, we don't, we don't like the idea of the council using the money that's on hand to buy that property," then we would have to. Okay. If, if it's a if it's council desire, we could we could still vet some of these options through the ad hoc groups in in, in this time period. Fairly. Just not, oh, just no, probably not everything. Of course, we would do that. We would never propose doing this without going back to those okay. groups. It's just these are options that we would discuss them if you're interested in doing. And I like the idea of using time. TIF money on hand to do that and not having to rely on a election to do. It, I think voters would approve it. Saves, it, it saves the bond cash and gives the cash flow good timing wise. Yeah, and we could say it's we got it. We got the money. We're gonna and we can go. We're gonna make this offer, and then it's just yeah. So I, I would I'd be okay with that. I I would say yes. Let's please call the Reeves Park and the Ruby Grant ad hoc committees back together. 
run through these options with them that would affect their parts and see what they say. Okay, any and using and oh, Joe, you ought to do that right to the board. I'm ready to do it. It just is <laughs> sorry. Just just give me options. 30 seconds uh, between comments. Okay. All right. Um, I, I think that we have said as much as we can about this, and I have some indication that we want to look at that TIF money as a possibility of funding as well. And Jeff's going to talk to the university and see how quickly we can get that done or not done, whichever. Oh. I'm tired. Yeah.